Welcome theater designers. This is Professor Seal and we're starting our journey today in theatrical design and production. Now, I know this is a fat book and let me just say we are not going to be looking at every page, but this has been an invaluable book in my life. Uh, there to help me troubleshoot problems in the theater. Uh, there's way more information in this book than we will go over in the course of this class because we are only focusing on the design side. But I think it's a great tool to have as you continue your journey, whatever that may be in theater, whether it's professional theater, educational theater, community theater, you have this manual, which is a great resource. Uh, side note, if you're going on to MTSU, this is also a book commonly used in stagecraft and other technical classes. So hold on to your book, people, if you are continuing your education after Motlow in theater. So today we'll be looking at some of the pages in chapters one and two, once again, the design pages rather than the production pages. But I'm excited to get started. One of my favorite quotes about art um, that is so true is that great art conceals art. If you took me for theater appreciation, you know I use this quote a lot um, because it's so true. A good theater designer can make design look so easy. Uh, you don't know how many different brick colors they looked at in order to finally pick the brick color they chose. Uh, you don't know how many rough drafts there were. And so um, one of my pet peeves is when you know, writers say, well, inspiration just flowed and the story just flowed out of me. That's not been my experience as a writer <laughs> uh, or a designer, right? It's messy. There are lots of rough drafts. There are lots of great ideas that we just didn't have time for. Um, and just because a play goes off without a hitch and you don't notice anything wrong with it does not mean that that theater design uh, wasn't painstakingly hard to do. Um, once again, if you've heard me use this analogy before, I apologize, but if you're watching the Olympics, the first time you watch a dive off the diving board, you sit back in wonder and awe and say, wow, how did they do that? And then by the third dive, you're like, oh, she forgot to point her toes, right? And we lose that sense of awe or wonder. And so if you go to a play and nothing happens wrong with the sound of the mics, the whole show... Uh, you may not even notice how great of a sound design uh, was implemented. Um, sometimes good design looks easy. Great art can seals art. Stanislavski, stay in the man. So today I'd like to focus on Hamilton. Uh, part of the reason I required you to subscribe to Disney Plus for this um, class was so that you could... Uh, go back to Hamilton. I'm just assuming you've already seen it. I know for this pilot class, some of you participated in Hamilton's. You could probably teach me a thing or two about Hamilton, um, but I know it's a common jumping off point for us, so uh, it's what I landed on for this lecture. So, productions start with the script. Productions start with the script. I um, have a theater friend of mine who dropped out of MTSU theater program, and they said, I really thought it was going to be, theater education was going to be more like Glee, and it ended up being a whole lot of reading. <laughs> and they were not wrong. It is a lot of reading when we get into the design process. You got to read and read and read some more. Um, some of us, myself included, got into theater because you didn't have to sit still. Uh, and for me, I just want to plug audiobooks for the hundredth time. If you know me, this is something I say on repeat. Uh, audiobooks have been so freeing for me. Uh, part of the reason I love studying Shakespeare is because you can find these wonderful recorded versions. You can watch a YouTube video and just have the words on in the background. Um, for me, a big part of reading through the script three times is listening through the script three times. But you know you are your own learning style. Um, I will say that I often have both. I have the hard copy of the script, of course, and I'm listening to it. Uh, and I've had students, you know, apologize to me. I'll, I'll walk into the dressing room and they'll be listening to uh, a YouTube version 
of what we're performing. And they'll say, oh, I'm sorry. I know that may be kind of unprofessional. And I never discourage that. I say, whatever your le learning modality is, embrace it. So um, getting that script, getting that original material, and then also those source materials. So um, if you don't know already, I teach quite a few uh, children's drama productions. We direct them. And so when we're looking at a story like Alice in Wonderland, we're not only dealing with the script we have in hand who has an adapter, we're also dealing with um, a famous classic fairy tale, right? So if you have source material, make sure that you're also looking at that source material. Of course, Hamilton um, is based off of this novel that... Lin-Manuel Miranda was reading on vacation when he uh, got the idea for this rap battle version of our founding fathers, which many of us have grown to know and love. So read the script, read the script, read the script. Uh, if that involves an audiobook, if that involves pen and paper, circle your favorite parts, uh, star your favorite parts, listen to your gut, listen to your instincts. This is my best advice for being a good designer is to know that script backwards and forwards and nothing will reflect worse in a design meeting, in a rehearsal, if you don't know the script back, backwards and forwards, right? Um, if you're dealing with a Shakespeare, for example, know the act and scene numbers, know what's going on in each scene. Uh, so that when you're breaking it down, you're not embarrassed. Uh, and that can be very hard when we're dealing with a script like Hamilton that has so many words and so many scenes. Uh, you know, you're working with a script like Hamlet. Maybe you've cut out half of the script, but there's still another half of the script to be familiar with if you're going to get the full picture. So study, study, study. Know it like the back of your hand. Don't be caught not understanding or not remembering all the references. Um, so what was Miranda's concept for Hamilton? So a production concept is um, the kind of seed. And if you took script analysis, uh, then you're overly familiar with a concept of a concept. <laughs> um, but it's sort of a one sentence, sort of a um, distilled version of the overall style of the show, the overall uh, vision for the show, uh, the creative interpretation of the show. So uh, Miranda has said over and over again in public settings that his concept was a story of America then told by America now. That's been sort of his catchphrase. If you've watched as many different uh, video documentaries, uh, all of these things, you can hear him say it on repeat. Uh, a concept, his concept is a story of America then told by America now. Now we'll um, say different producers and designers and playwrights will have concepts. Some of them are more esoteric, more visual. One of my favorite designer directors is Julie Taymor, and she tends more towards an Eastern model, or some would argue a more feminine model of saying, okay, let's find a shape, like a circle. Uh, let's find a color that's really influential to our concept. Um, so a concept can be kind of a thing that's hard to to pin down, and when you work with different um, directors, you may work with different concepts. Um, but the concept is that central creative idea, right? That central creative idea that everybody can get behind. And if you start a process and you don't have a clear concept, then it's going to end up being as messy as it is in your head. Um, one thing that often happens with non-professional theater is we get started on the show and then we're trying to find a concept as we work on this script. Uh, and that is very backwards. And it, when you're working in professional theater, 
you know, the design team starts meeting, you know, a year in advance of when you actually cast the show and you're able to really spend the good time working on that concept and um, helping the director articulate that concept. Uh, but a good concept is just one sentence, right? It's nice and succinct, succinct right? Um, and it brings unity. It brings everybody together. So remember for this class you're going to find a new concept for much ado about nothing um, and the good news for you is that your concept is your own you don't have to try to communicate it to a production team which to me is one of the hardest elements of working on design is communicating your ideas within your production team now for the sake of clarity and brevity i've only picked two designers here david corens and paul taswell um, I know there's a much bigger production team for Hamilton. Uh, obviously, the producers, the director, the lighting designer, the sound designer, all of those people would be at a design team. Um, but like I said, for the, for the sake of uh, being brief, we're just going to focus on a few different elements of design in this course and mostly a little bit of sound design but a lot of scenic and costume design. I find that students find um, scenic and costume design the most accessible, right? You have a house, you, you've decorated your house, or maybe you have an apartment, you have a dwelling, <laughs> I'm assuming. Uh, you have a body, you're used to putting on clothes, that's pretty accessible for you. When we start talking about lighting design, it gets much more technical and esoteric. And so I'm teaching design principles that also would apply to light design, right, throughout this course. But we'll focus primarily on scenic and costume design. So at these production meetings, it may seem overly simplistic to say, but the best production meetings are conversations, not lectures. So you do have to share, if you're the director, enough of your vision that other people can get on board or can catch your vision. Um, but it needs to be a conversation. And if you as a designer come in, you do need to listen to your director. You need to respect the authority of your director. Um, but then you can also bring in your own ideas and, um, it can be a very fun, magical time of spitballing and brainstorming. And it can also be a very disheartening time. If you have what you consider a great idea and you go to that collaboration table and you don't feel respected or it gets shot down, um, you know, that can be pretty hard. So just brace yourself for that. Um, so I've listened to a few interviews with both Taswell and Corins, and both have said, how did they get the job? By being cooperative, right? Uh, Miranda, obviously they have skill, they have talent, they're hardworking, uh, they were established Broadway designers, but they had worked with people who had worked on the production team with Miranda, and they were recommended. So one of my biggest advice to future theater artists or current theater artists is to be collaborative, right? Be the kind of people who people want to work with. Be inspiring. Be responsible. Um, be um, present when you're there. Uh, and um, I know that there have been people who have big, big personalities and act out and they live in legends like the rock stars of theater design, but they are few and far between. Most designers got where they are. Um, these guys admit they got where they are because they had collaborated with those designers before who were already on the concept meetings. They had collaborated with Miranda. They were collaborative people. They wanted to listen to each other, right? When Corin sat down and looked at you know, eight different types of brick. He was considering the skin colors of the actors on stage. He was considering Taswell's costumes. He was working to create this beautiful unified vision and not just say, well, I like red bricks, so we're doing red bri bricks, right? He was a team player and that's what set him apart as part of the design team. All right, so as promised, we're gonna skip, skip, skip ahead. You can see rehearsal reports. We're skipping over that. Lighting personnel, sound crew. Sorry guys, you really, really matter. I don't mean to skip you, but 
We can only talk about so much in this abbreviated class, and I want you to have plenty of time to work on your models and your renderings. So we're starting in chapter two with design process, right? So we've already spoken about committing to the project and committing to doing your best work. That's really got to start there. Um, but we're moving on, on page 23 in the design process to analysis, right? A good designer learns to prioritize. A good designer learns to prioritize. You may have heard it this way, time is the enemy of art. Time is the enemy of art. So you have to decide, okay, I can't, I don't have a huge design team at Motlo. I don't have a huge, a whole room full of stitchers. So I need to figure out what I have the time and energy to invest in. So we have this graph here. Um, and what you may have heard said before is I can I can make it fast, I can make it cheap, or I can make it great, but you can't have all three, right? So if you want a fast and cheap Halloween costume, I can go to Halloween costumes right now and buy a $2 mask made in China. It'll be here tomorrow. They're going to Amazon Prime it right to us. But will it last the whole show if we have 15 performances of the children's drama? Maybe not, right? So that might that cheap oriental trading mask, not, not to disparage China, they make beautiful work. But if I'm buying a cheap Halloween costume, it may be cheap, it may be fast, but it's going to be green there. It's going to be not great, right? Now, if I lovingly plaster your face and then I create a mold and I uh, do a reverse transfer and then I lovingly paint and bead said mask and it perfectly fits you and I have all of the time in the world to do that, I can have a great and cheap mask. It's just made out of plaster. It is beautiful. I've solidified it with some big, strong uh, ad adhesive. I have a beautifully handmade, crafted mask, right? Um, and, but it's not going to be fast. I will have spent hours lovingly placing every bead. And it may be cheap because it's just made out of plaster, uh, fake gems, not real gems, but it's definitely not going to be fast to place every tiny little thing. Right. Now, if I'm trying to make this mask and I want to make it quickly and I want it to be great, I could walk into the shelves of Joann's or Hobby Lobby or Michael's and I could pick out a really expensive um, mask pre-made and then I can buy some beautiful feathers and some sequins and I can spend a thousand dollars on craft supplies for this one mask. I can make a pretty mask. Let me tell you, I can sink some money into a craft score, store, ask my husband, but it's not going to be cheap. So this is one of the reasons it's so smart in the design process to get started early to make sure that you're prioritizing how you use your time, especially if you're working on a low budget production, because you can't have it all. You can't have something great, fast, and cheap. So you need to prioritize for yourself, your resources. You know, if I'm going to do a play like um, Miss Saigon, I got to focus on that helicopter. I got to make the helicopter come in because that's the big finale. That's the big ending um fireworks 11th hour moment one of a mistake I made uh, and I'm just trying to be real with you guys I'm going to try to uh, not be too hard on myself in this class but I can remember one of the first musicals I directed at Motlow was Once Upon a Mattress and I just started at the beginning and worked towards the end the costumes were beautiful I rented them to save money but spent hours at the rental shop um, may it rest in peace it's closed performance studios in Nashville um, but I spent hours picking through the costumes. What I didn't focus on 
was the trick at the end if you're familiar with Once Upon a Mattress, of a bunch of mattresses stacked on each other. And um, at the last gag is them sort of pulling out all of these found objects from underneath the mattresses, um, which exposes it's the story of the Princess of the Pea. It exposes how they kind of cheated to let the princess be the princess and to undermine the queen. Um, but I didn't really focus on that gag and it sort of snuck up on me and it really wasn't a very powerful moment. It wasn't really a very, um, I thought a hundred percent effective as a device because I didn't focus on it early in the play. So you need to prioritize what are those big moments that really sell your show and really tell the story and make sure that you're putting your time, money and resources into those moments. Um, even if that's not, pretty medieval gowns, which is what interested me, right? It was all the velvet, beautiful gowns. So I love this little meme down here because you, when you start a creative process, you know, one minute you love your design concept, one minute uh, you hate your design concept. By the end, you know, during tech, you're thinking this thing is never going to get off the ground. And then by the time you have a show on its feet, hopefully you've come back full circle and you love the production again, although I will admit it doesn't always work out that way. So, so on page 24, we're looking at the design process, the design process, and it's giving you on page 24, three different times you read the script. Um, I will say, um, if you've taken my script analysis class, you already kind of know, um, as a woman, I would say sometimes I process things differently uh, than these two men. And I don't mean to over exaggerate gender roles or anything like that, but a play may give you a feeling. You may see a color, you may have an intuition. Um, so don't, um, don't discredit that. Take notes as you read the script. And um, he does say for that first reading, just try to enjoy it. Right. Um, just read it and try to enjoy it. It's really important that as we as theater artists look at our script, we don't dissect it so much that we lose sight of the mosaic that it is. And if we find joy, if we have our favorite moments, um, we need to cling to that and go back to that later in the script when maybe we've read it so much that it's lost some of its meaning. But um, pay attention to that first read. Have fun with it really um, absorb it as a whole thing. Now, sometimes you might be reading a play like Buried Child and you're like, Professor Seal, I can't possibly enjoy this. It's dark, it's heavy, uh, it's painful. Um, and so for that, I would say find the gravitas, find the meaning in it, not necessarily, maybe fun is the wrong word there <laughs> to simplify. Read it the second time for inspiration. Really let your imagination run wild. Find those textures, right? Find those um, atmospheric words that really paint the picture. Um, just brainstorm and write down all of those notes we were talking about that inspire you about the script. And then the third time, this is when we really need to get into reading it for the nitty gritty, right? And this is, I will say, do as I say, not as I do. Because when I'm reading scripts to figure out what children's play I should do or, um, you know, what fall spring production we should do, I'm the worst about getting to the fourth page and being like, oh, there's a man-eating plant. This is impossible for us to do, right? So, of course, I... Sometimes I get over that, um, but when you're just so used to looking at it from a designer, producer, director, theater creator mind, uh, it can be hard to get past that. Um, now, I will say there have been some scripts I couldn't possibly imagine it the first time I read it, but then I see it produced somewhere, and I'm like, oh, this script is genius. And I think part of what's hard for some more esoteric writers is that we do sometimes have a hard time putting it on the stage and they get neglected until somebody um, amazing takes it and does something great with it and is able to see through the challenges. He's very intentional. He's very intentional in this book about using words like challenges rather than problems, keeping it positive, um, 
but I do think um, part of the reason I picked Much Ado About Nothing is because it's so stageable, right? I think uh, it's a really accessible play. You can have a lot of fun with it, but you don't have that helicopter moment or that chandelier falling moment or one of those big events that feels impossible. So back to Hamilton, um, when we're in the research process, we look at um, two different types of research. The first being background research, right? Um, this is your times that you go and you can see Lin-Manuel Miranda sitting in Aaron Burr's actual bedroom for inspiration. Isn't that so cool? Our other um, scenic designer talked about visiting. Over here we have the Schuyler Mansion and walking around and really absorbing the feeling. Of course, this is Monticello for those of you who've never been. Uh, I'm sure it was daunting, and I've heard them talk about in interviews how daunting it was to sort of put these things to paper because we have these iconic photos like George Washington crossing the Hudson. Uh, we have these pictures that were in our history books growing up and there is you know an entire section of the population that's obsessed with the founding fathers right so doing your background research he sort of interestingly um, warns about being roadkill on the information highway if you get lost down a google spiral um, and and one thing that can be kind of difficult with that is, is I do think there's misinformation on the internet. I do think there's grainy pictures on the internet, but I, I spend most of my research on the internet. I always try to go to, you know, websites that are reputable, like the Smithsonian. I think museum websites are very helpful um, personally. And I'm not saying this is a model for you to model. I'm just saying I Pinterest. I love to find those pictures and save them onto a pin board and that helps me quick reference them back. I'm a very visual person and so having those collages on Pinterest really helped me to sort of organize my information and quick reference back to it. Don't forget to save your work. I know I sound like a middle school writing teacher but you know if you find a cool fact or cool picture make sure to stick a sticky note in that book um, take a picture of it with your phone, uh, save it on Pinterest, save it in your Google Doc or Drive. Um, don't let it slip through your fingers because there's very, very frustrating when you've seen it somewhere. The other really important reason for you to save that historical information is remember you don't want to copy it exactly. And that can be something in the creative process where we may even forget that we saw that initial picture and then we replicate it and then we go back and say, oh my goodness, I didn't mean to plagiarize that content, but it seeped into my subconscious and it came back out. So um, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does. If we look at like comedians telling a joke that someone else has told and they genuinely say, I, I forgot that I had heard that joke, right? Um, our, our memories are tricky things. So as you're researching, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do, be organized, keep track, um, make photocopies if you're in an old school library, um, and, and utilize all of those saving techniques. Um, I will say research is one of my favorite elements of design. Some scripts um, will require it more than others, um, but I would say no matter if you set it on the moon, you still want to be familiar with what are the sci-fi tropes that we've seen in American television, for example, that your audience will be familiar with. Even if you set it on the moon, it needs to be um, informed with what your audience expects. So no reason not to do your research. So <laughs> this is such a nice way of saying this, and it feels almost dishonest <laughs> the way he spins it here. Um, but this is, when he says concept research, he's saying, find the problems. When you read the script, where are your chandeliers? Where are your uh, quick changes? Where are the problem moments in your script that you have to work around, right? Um, Corins rightly says that his biggest concern was the 25,000 word document. And he had to create a set design that moved as quickly as the words. 
and I think he did it, which is phenomenal. You can see how he worked so seamlessly with the choreographer to get the um, chairs moved or the uh, lights for the outdoor scene or the chandelier coming in. All those transitions are so seamless to keep the show in the pace of the show going because uh, Miranda's not slowing down for anybody. So um, I think another really important thing that they talk about on page 27, 27 is perceptual block, right? Obviously, we've heard of writer's block when you kind of staring at a blank computer screen and you can't seem to find the next words to go on the page but you can get the same thing when it comes to a production you can kind of get stuck on something and um, that perceptual block can really be frustrating your brain goes numb you just can't see any way through it um and hopefully you have plenty of time to work through that perceptual block. But if it happens to you, please know it's normal. It's part of the process. It's frustrating, but you can get through it, right? We can do hard things in the theater. We work our magic all the time. Little baby chicks. So incubation. Incubation is... Um, let me, uh, real quick, I, I had a great funny quote from Corin's, which was, designing is often like pulling a piano out of a swamp, <laughs> which I just thought is so true. Uh, you know, it feels impossible, it seems impossible, but we can work our magic. Sorry, back to incubation. So incubation is the process of giving your subconscious time to sort out the information you've gathered. So we do all of this research. We read and read and read. We look and look and look. Uh, we go to these museums, we go to these architectural sites to be inspired, you know, um, and then we got to let it cook a while, right? Just like a little baby chicken has to sit under that warm lamp before it hatches. Our ideas need you to go take a walk. Your ideas need you to go take a shower. Your ideas need you to... Um, go to sleep, right? That famous, when you're trying to make a hard decision, go sleep on it. Um, and so this is one of the reasons it's really important not to procrastinate because your brain needs time to sort of sort it out and, and figure it out. This isn't a reason to procrastinate. And um, I don't mean to say that incubation is um afforded in every situation. Sometimes incubation is a luxury. But if you have the time to sort of wait for those light bulb moments instead of trying to force it, um, if you chain yourself to your desk and make yourself think, 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 think about it, um, then that can be kind of counterintuitive because that, that stress that you're putting on your brain and on the creative process is only going to block you up. It's only going to um, become a hurdle for you to get over. So rather than turning into a stress ball, try to get moving, do some yoga, um, take a shower, relax, and see if some of those light bulbs don't start to come to you when you least su suspect it, because that's really going to be a powerful part of your thinking, right? And on page 28 is another uh, unblocking your thinking thing. One thing that can happen um, that they talk about on 28 is visual stereotyping. So you may have it in your head. Okay, I've only ever seen this costume portrayed as the Halloween costume version of this, of this, you know, and you can kind of get stuck on that overly simplistic costume design. Um, and that can be frustrating to you. And so what I would challenge you to do is avoid that low hanging fruit. The exception to the stereotyping, I would say, is children's theater. You, When you're dealing with children, sometimes you need to go with the more relatable, the more stereotypical concepts, just so your kids understand it. Um, not always, right? If we look at what Julie Taymor did with Lion King, not always. Um, but when you get to those mental blocks or that tunnel vision, um, Go 
back to your designs, go back to places that inspire you, go back to moments in the script, um, and be patient with yourself. Try not to be too hard on yourself, because if you get into negative self-talk, if you get into a stress ball again, your the flow of your creative energy could be stifled. And there are numerous TED Talks about creative processes, and um, I, I will try to link some of those in the For Your Fun section of the class. All right, so the white model, this is something you'll be asked to do, and um, it's, I often refer to it as a white model. Your book calls it a functional model, which makes a lot of sense. So the functional model is a 3D thumbnail sketch of the scenic design. So you want to do one quarter inch in your design for every foot of actual stage floor, right? So it's a tiny little mini model. And the advantage to that is that you can um, take it with you when you're going somewhere, you know, box it up and take it to rehearsal to show the other people in the cast. Um, they even talked about in your textbook how... Um, 3D printing has created tiny, tiny models, even smaller, so that they're even more portable. Um, and I think that's great. One of the advantages to Powers Auditorium is it is already a pretty small space. So a one quarter inch model actually fits on a piece of graph paper. So that's fantastic to not have to scale it down anymore for um for my book work because once again I'm scenic design uh, director uh, you know so I'm using that same um, ground plan to do my blocking and then I'm also the costume designer and so uh, that's kind of how I'm going to go out about this is convenience um, you know using your time uh, to make gut reaction decisions, uh, working quickly, working efficiently, because that's my process. If you were taking this class from a uh, professional scenic designer who's working on Broadway, they're not going to talk to you like this. Um, so take that for what it is. It's only my perspective. Um, but you can see how beautifully clean these lines are. He's He has itemized every single little line in the wood grain just beautifully. He's included um, the top of the um, eight feet here of, of wall is added after intermission, which is really cool conceptually that they're building America and they're adding bricks to the wall. It's one of those details that um, is easy to miss when you're watching the film, but um, creating this functional white model helps us see the scale, helps us talk and figure out one of the most basic things for me is where are we gonna do storage in the wings, um, trying to fit things in our tiny space. Um, but this Hamilton model is just poetry, isn't it? It's gorgeous. So my last thought is about the production model. Right, so the production model is the same thing as a functional model, just painted and fully um, detailed out. So you may include a prop, you may include um, a little person to help you see the scale of the size of other things. And we'll talk more about production models when we get to your assignment um, in the second half of the semester of creating your own white model and your own production model. Um, but I just think this one is beautiful, so I had to show it off here early in the process. So implementation is when we get into production models. You know, this is obviously later in the process, um, and uh, we have a great example on page 31 also of those pencil sketches of the three weird sisters from the Scottish play. I guess I'm not in a theater, I'll say it, Macbeth. <laughs> So um, creating this paperwork, creating these mini models helps us collaborate. That's really the goal of these. Um, you know, I'm going to show you my white model, my production model, and it has been through the ringer, right? Uh, my 
my box set that I've created has been with me for eight years and it's rough around the edges, but it's a tool, right? Um, this is cute. It's a nice little dollhouse, but it's also a tool for us to communicate our ideas, to synchronize our ideas, to come to this magical um, meshing that happens in the theater. And um, it, when it's right, it is right. And it's so rewarding. Uh, so I almost hate that I have to teach this as an online course, of course, in the middle of our pandemic, because I do think having you work in partners, having you work in teams to sort of collaborate and create together would be so much more educational. Um, but here are the times we are in, and it's just not practical. And remember also you doing your own work helps you to be able to have that production portfolio to take into an interview to say, here are my great ideas, here is my style, and here are pictures of my white model, my production model, and it can help you secure that job or secure that scholarship at a four-year school. So that's another big goal of this class is for you to be able to do good work that you are proud of. Show them what you got. Go Bucks. Thank you for listening.